London, a city that never slows down. Millions of journeys begin here every day, across streets that trace ancient history, across bridges that span a modern skyline, through tunnels carved deep below the surface. Movement is more than a necessity here, it's the force that built this capital. Every day, millions depend on trains to keep the capital alive, but for decades London's railways were running out of room, more people, more homes, more jobs, but no more space on the tracks. The solution would become the biggest construction project Europe had seen this century. A brand new underground railway stretching from east to west, a network built to connect communities, shrink journey times, and propel the city into the future. This is the story of how London created the Elizabeth Line, how a bold idea became a monumental engineering achievement, and how, despite delays and soaring costs, it changed the city forever. The origins of the Elizabeth Line begin long before construction started. Back in the 1940s, planners already knew that the railways would one day struggle with demand. London was growing faster and further than ever before. After the Second World War, new towns developed around the outskirts and commuters packed into the city daily. By the 1970s, capacity was stretched near breaking point. The government commissioned major studies into how to prepare for the future. The 1974 London Rail Study proposed a new deep-level line running across the capital. Not north-south like many of the existing tube lines, but east-west, directly through central London. In 1989, the Central London Rail Study refined the idea. It gave the line a name, Crossrail. This new railway would link the eastern suburbs, including busy commuter towns and industrial hubs, to the rapidly expanding Docklands, and heading west, it would connect to Heathrow Airport, then the busiest airport in Europe. The economic logic was clear. The capital needed better links, or it would choke on its own success. But large-scale public projects in Britain often collide with the same obstacles, politics and money. In 1991, the first Crossrail Bill was introduced in Parliament. On paper, the plan was ambitious and visionary, but the case simply wasn't strong enough for the government of the time. Three years later, in 1994, the bill was rejected. For a while, Crossrail seemed destined to remain nothing more than lines on a map. But cities don't stop growing, and London didn't slow down. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, Canary Wharf rose into a forest of skyscrapers. Tens of thousands of jobs moved east. Heathrow expanded again and again. London's transport system was struggling to cope. It was becoming impossible to ignore the problem. The newly formed Transport for London, or TFL for short, was in charge of dealing with this situation. Support came from local leaders, business owners and global investors. Even the Canary Wharf Group pledged tens of millions of pounds toward constructing a station, recognising the enormous benefit to the financial district. Finally, in July 2008, after long parliamentary debate, the Crossrail Act received royal assent. London's largest infrastructure project in more than a century was officially approved and funded. In May 2009, construction began at Canary Wharf. What followed would reshape the city beneath the surface. To build Crossrail, engineers had to thread tunnels through one of the most complex underground environments on Earth. Older tube tunnels, deep sewers, foundations of iconic buildings all stood in the way. Every meter had to be meticulously mapped and monitored. Eight enormous tunnel-boring machines were assembled, each more than 150 meters long and weighing over a thousand tons. They were given names, Ada, Phyllis, Elizabeth, Victoria and others, a London tradition honoring important women in history. These mechanical giants chewed their way beneath the capital, laying concrete rings behind them as they advanced. Over 42 kilometers of brand new tunnels took shape. At peak construction, more than 10,000 workers were spread across 40 different sites, above and below ground. But stations were just as challenging as the tunnels themselves. Farringdon was designed to handle 150 trains per hour, when combined with the Thameslink line, making it one of the busiest interchanges in the entire country. Tottenham Court Road was expanded far beyond its original design, a complete rebuild to prepare for massive new passenger numbers. Liverpool Street and Bond Street were reshaped with vast new concourses and escalator networks. Every station required not only space, 
but modern safety systems, accessibility upgrades and engineering precision. By 2015, the physical tunnels were complete. On the surface, it looked like Crossrail was nearly ready, but the hardest work was yet to come. Railways are no longer just tracks and trains, they're digital ecosystems. The Elizabeth Line needed to connect three different signalling systems, one for the western routes toward Heathrow, another for the eastern lines toward Shenfield, and a completely new system inside the central tunnels, capable of automatic train operation. Making these systems talk to each other seamlessly proved incredibly complex. Software wasn't behaving as expected. Testing revealed integration issues at every turn. A small glitch in one part of the network could stop the entire railway. New trains, the Class 345 fleet, were state-of-the-art. Long walk-through carriages, air-conditioned, packed with sensors and real-time passenger information, but without reliable digital signalling, they couldn't run through the tunnels. The scheduled opening date, December 2018, began to look impossible. The launch was delayed, then delayed again. Leadership changes were made. Costs climbed from the original 14.8 billion to nearly 19 billion pounds. Critics called it a disaster. Newspapers ran angry headlines. Public frustration grew. And then the world changed. The COVID-19 pandemic shut down construction sites. Workers could not access tunnels or control centers. Progress ground to a halt for months. But despite every setback, engineers and operators refused to give up. Testing continued day and night when possible. Every issue was hunted down and solved. The Elizabeth line was too important to fail. Finally, in 2022, years late, billions over budget, the new railway was ready. In May of that year, Queen Elizabeth II visited Paddington Station. There, she unveiled the plaque officially naming the line in her honor, the Elizabeth Line, one of the final public engagements of her historic reign. On the 24th of May 2022, the public boarded the first trains through the central tunnels. The moment London had waited for, passengers cheered. Transport workers who had spent careers building this project watched with pride. A once impossible railway was now real. Later that year, through services began linking the tunnels directly to western and eastern branches. And by May 2023, full end-to-end -end journeys became possible from Reading and Heathrow in the west, right through central London, to Shenfield and Abbey Wood in the east. The impact was immediate. Travel times collapsed. Paddington to Canary Wharf in 17 minutes. Liverpool Street to Heathrow in around 35. Door-to-door -door convenience transformed daily life for commuters, families and businesses alike. The Elizabeth Line added around 10% to London's entire rail capacity overnight. It opened up new housing opportunities in the Thames Gateway. It supported job growth and economic expansion across multiple boroughs. It gave London the connectivity boost it desperately needed. Today, the line stretches 118 kilometres. It serves 41 stations. At peak service, trains run every few minutes through the central core. On a typical weekday, around half a million passengers rely on it. Engineers call it one of the most complex railway integrations ever completed in Europe. City planners call it the most important UK infrastructure project since the turn of the century. And for many Londoners, it's simply the easier commute they always hoped for. Mega projects are rarely smooth. They are messy, expensive and full of conflict. Crossrail was all of those things, but history doesn't remember delays. History remembers impact. The Elizabeth Line is a railway built for generations still to come. A network connecting people to work, to opportunity, to family and friends. A new backbone for a growing capital. And a legacy to a queen who served longer than any other in British history. After decades of planning, drilling, wiring, testing and overcoming adversity, London finally has its modern east-west artery and this story isn't over. Because proposals for a crossrail too a brand new north-south high-capacity route is already in development. It would link Surrey to Hertfordshire through a tunnel beneath central London, easing pressure on some of the most overcrowded lines in the UK. Although currently paused, the idea remains very much alive. As the population continues to rise, another major railway may soon become not just desirable, but necessary. The Elizabeth Line has shown what is possible.
Crossrail proved that London can still dream big, dig deep and deliver a future-proof transport network. And one day trains on a second Crossrail might join them beneath the city. For now this is just the beginning. A new era of London transport has arrived and the journey continues.